And the next item of business is stage three debate on motion 20705 in the name of Kate Forbes on the non-domestic rates Scotland bill. Before I invite Kate Forbes to open that debate, I call on Derek Mackay to signify Crown consent to the bill. Derek Mackay. Uh, for the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purpose of the non-domestic rate Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interest, so far as they are affected by the Bill, at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you, Mr Mackay. Uh, we will now begin the debate. And can I ask members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and move the motion for up to seven minutes. Please, Minister, no longer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I'm pleased to open the Stage 3 debate on the non-domestic rates Scotland Bill. And I wanted to start with a, a number of thank yous. First, to the Local Government and Communities Committee and also the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the Bill. I had the pleasure of meeting Ken Barclay for the first time yesterday and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank him for his contribution to the review that led us to this Bill as well. Now, Presiding Officer, taking us back a, a number of years, the Barclay Review was uh, established with a very specific remit. And that remit was, and I quote, to make recommendations that seek to enhance and reform the non-domestic rate system in Scotland to better support business growth and long-term investment and reflect changing marketplaces. Now, I think that need for reform was widely recognised across the Chamber and indeed only two weeks ago, uh, Mr Fraser uh, wrote in a national newspaper on behalf of the Conservatives that, and I quote, it is our view that the current system of rates is in need of comprehensive reform. I'll say it once and that's all wise words indeed. The bill was introduced to support growth improve the administration of the system and to increase fairness for ratepayers. I think it's fair to say that after a few bumpy weeks, it does just that. It, this has been a bill built on collaboration and consultation. I'd like to think, thank the individuals on the Barclay Review Implementation Group and the associated subgroups who have devoted their time freely to the development of the bill provisions. And I'd also like to thank the members of the business community as well as officials in councils and assessors offices across the country who have worked to deliver a bill which not only delivers the word and the spirit of the Barclay Review, but also work on the ground operationally. And finally, I'd like to thank COSLA for their recognition that non-domestic rates is too important to be considered in isolation of the wider fiscal framework arrangements and treated like a plaything or a negotiating tactic. And I look forward to working with them closely on the fiscal framework, which will proceed at pace. This bill, which is the first non-domestic rates bill that's come before the Scottish Parliament, was introduced to deliver the review. And the review made 30 recommendations. And I think uh, Derek Mackay is to be commended for how quickly he moved in yeah, introducing yeah. Yeah, the recommendations yeah. that could be introduced without <laughs> primary legislation. And he did that, and I've been pleased to take forward uh, this bill, to support growth, to improve administration of the system, and to increase fairness. We've just had a debate, presiding officer, on uh, the budget and the need for economic growth. And this bill is integrally linked to the economic performance of our businesses. The Scottish Government accepted the majority of those recommendations and, where possible, did move quickly. The best examples of those are the Business Growth Accelerator, the only one of its kind in the UK, and Nursery Relief as well, which supports our expansion of nursery and childcare. Those were under serious threat of abolition until about six, uh, till, uh, yesterday. The bill delivers other re recommendations as well, which did require primary legislation. Probably of most importance is the move to a three-year revaluation cycle mm -hmm. to minimise the risks of the volatility which the adoption of a one-year tone date should um, reduce. It will ensure rateable values are more closely aligned with real market rents, mm -hmm. and it's been widely welcomed across the board by the business community. The bill also gives new powers to assessors, local authorities, and ministers to improve the administration of the system and to tackle tax avoidance, again, something I think that every member in this chamber supports. 
But perhaps most critically, the bill delivers reforms to the appeal system that are intended to reduce the reliance on the formal appeal system and speed up access to justice for those properties that are involved in that system. I've said it consistently throughout the bill's progress um, through a uh, parliament that if we don't get the appeals right, then the rest of the reforms are redundant. These systematic reforms will benefit around 255,000 non-domestic properties in Scotland, 90% of whom already benefit from a lower poundage in Scotland than they would elsewhere in the UK and the most generous package of reliefs available anywhere on these islands. As legislators, I believe we've got a duty to deliver legislation that improves outcomes for stakeholders and we take that seriously. And in a par parliament of minorities, no legislation will deliver everything we want, so it comes down to priorities. And I think we've seen that quite starkly from the Conservatives in particular, because it's unfortunate that avoiding a level of playing field between independent schools and local authority schools appears to have become so totemic to the Scottish Conservatives in the process that 125 affected properties were considered to be of greater priority than the other 255,000 non-domestic properties. The decision whether to support this bill this evening comes down to a simple question of whether we believe the rate system needs reform or not. The Scottish Government view is that the reforms proposed by the Barclay Review strike the right balance between ambition and pragmatism. Mm. Most of those reforms could not be implemented mid-revaluation mm. and we simply cannot wait until 2027 to implement the Barclay reforms the majority of which are universally welcomed by ratepayers and administrators alike. We need more regular revaluations. We need a reformed appeals process. We need greater powers to tackle rates avoidance and councils and assessors need the tools to do their jobs more efficiently and effectively. Surely we can all agree on that. That is the prize that is on offer this evening. That it delivers the cross-party agreement that the rate system needs reformed and I encourage everyone in the chamber to support those critical reforms. And so I move the motion in my name. And I call Murdo Fraser for no more than six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I make some concluding remarks in relation to the non-domestic rates bill? This is a bill, as we've heard, that seeks to implement the findings of the Barclay Review into non-domestic rates, many of which were very welcome. The move from a five-year to a three-year revaluation cycle is one which has been supported by the business community, as indeed are proposals for a business accelerator, which will create an incentive for businesses to expand and help to remove the existing disincentive for speculative development by landlords. If it works, it will stimulate growth and investment and assist economic growth. Now, some of the technical changes in the bill, making it easier to collect information from ratepayers and improving transparency will also be welcome. The bill does not, of course, implement all the findings of the Barclay Review. This is a review which, in our opinion, was, was hamstrung from the very start by being told it had to be revenue neutral and therefore had to look for means of raising money to balance out new reliefs being granted. Ken Barclay and his colleagues found two targets to raise extra money, the first being local authority Alios. Uh, and the second being independent schools. The recommendation to end the tax relief for alios proved to be highly controversial, with local authorities across the country complaining rightly that this would mean a negative impact on their budgets and or uh, an increase in charges at the likes of local leisure centres and swimming pools. Fortunately, following vigorous opposition from the Scottish Conservatives against the swim tax, the Scottish Government decided to U-turn and back down on this particular proposal. Regrettably, the Scottish Government did not back down in relation to the other measure intended to raise additional funds, namely a change to the tax treatment on independent schools. And yesterday, we set out some of the arguments why we felt uh, that was the wrong move. As the Office of the Scottish Charity uh, Regulator has made clear, a number of independent schools are in a marginal financial position. For example, in Perth and Kinross, I can think of five independent schools which have closed in the last two decades. Schools like Rannick, Crofton, Lone and Butterston, all of which not only provided education, but also were important parts of local economies. And the money spent in independent schools supports jobs in what are often rural areas, directly in terms of teaching and non-teaching staff in schools, 
but also in terms of the broader spend in economies. And we see that in a local economy in a town like Creef, in which there are a number of local independent schools in the area where shops, hospitality businesses and local tradespeople, their livelihood depends upon the existence of those schools and the spend from the school and the staff who work there. And the same would apply to a town like Dollar in Clackmannanshire, where the major local employer is Dollar Academy. And taxing these schools will have a negative economic impact. Now, that's not to suggest that a school of the size of Dollar Academy is necessarily going to close because of this bill, but there are smaller independent schools, including small Christian schools, as we heard yesterday, which may find themselves in that category. Uh, yes, I'll give way, Mr. Keith Brown. Brown. Uh, can I thank Murder Fraser for taking the intervention? And he's mentioned Dollar now for the second time. Can I just ask whether he's actually spoken to the rector at Dollar Academy on this issue? If he's spoken to him. Colin Liz Fraser. Smith has engaged with Dollar Academy and many of the parents at Dollar precisely on this issue, and they share uh, many of our concerns about this particular matter. So I think, I think there, is, there is a concern about this. And, and what we haven't heard from the Scottish Government, we didn't hear this from the Minister yesterday, is any attempt to defend or justify this policy. And I suspect what really behind this, lies behind this is the Scottish Government's view is that this is a sector easy, is an easy one to attack. It has few political friends. It all has the unhealthy stench of the politics of envy about it. And there's the reason why, with regret, we cannot support a bill despite agreeing with a lot of what the bill contains. There is a broader point, presiding officer, in relation to rates more generally. While the Barclay Review recommendations are generally positive, our concern is that they don't go far enough. There is a serious debate to be had about the future of the rating system more generally. What we've seen in recent years are a number of sticking plaster solutions being introduced to deal with complaints from businesses about rates increases from revaluations, for example, relief brought in for the hospitality sector or for offices in the northeast of Scotland. Now, moving from a five-year to a three-year cycle will improve matters, but it won't eradicate the problem entirely. And there's also a serious question as to whether a property-based tax is still relevant, particularly as it relates to a sector like retail, in an environment where retail is under pressure increasingly from online traders. And there is simply no level playing field to, between online retail and one having to support high street premises. And it is our view, therefore, that a more fundamental look at the whole rating system is required, just as being, is currently being proposed by the government south of the border. And I know that that is a view widely supported in the business community. And I hope that is something that the Scottish Government will take forward in future. The final point I want to make, presiding officer, is that no discussion on rates would be complete without a mention of the large business supplement, currently set at a rate in Scotland nearly double that south of the border. There are more than 5,000 retail premises in Scotland paying the LBS, cumulatively contributing more than £14 million annually. That puts them at a competitive disadvantage compared to the rest of the UK. It is a measure long overdue for being dealt with. And who knows, maybe in the budget tomorrow, the finance sector will have some good news for us on the large business supplement. So in conclusion, presiding officer, there is much in this bill that we support. But due to the tax rate in independent schools, a tax rate which will damage local economies and which seems to be motivated purely by the politics of envy. I regret this is not legislation we can support at decision time this afternoon. Called Sarah Boyack for up to five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, I do want to thank all those who contributed to this debate, um, both yesterday in the discussions we had, but also over the last few months which took us from the stage one discussions to today. I do want to thank all those people who got in touch with us, whether it was national organisations and trade organisations, and also the local groups and individual constituents who got in touch. And I do want to say at this point, a thank you to the staff in the Scottish Government and our own clerks in the Parliament, who I believe have helped all of us as committee members and MSPs in making sure that our amendments were crafted to deliver what we intended and that we were able to have informed debates on what is a hugely important issue. And I do want to finally briefly thank the Minister for her constructive approach, both to the debate and for being prepared to discuss and work with us, even when she did not actually always agree with us. She was at least prepared to sit down and make sure that our amendments were crafted correctly. Um, and I think both the Minister and Murdo Fraser have highlighted that the new changes that are being brought with this bill. I want to highlight a couple of issues that were raised 
um, during the discussions at stage two, um, and we dealt with them then, but they were issues that haven't been mentioned yet, but I think are important to put on the record. Firstly, on timing, I, I was very glad that colleagues supported my amendment to increase the time businesses have to notify of a change in circumstances from 21 to 42 days, reflecting the pressures and the challenges that small businesses in particularly face in reaching such a tight deadline. That was something raised which I think was important to act upon, and it was a, an issue that was then followed up by Graeme Simpson in his amendment yesterday. Secondly, I want to raise the issue of phoenixing, which I put on the agenda through a probing amendment. Now, phoenixing is where companies still operate from a premises or address, but reinvent themselves potentially through the use of shell companies to evade their responsibilities for paying tax for the local services they use. The discussion we had around that was very constructive and it secured a commitment from the Scottish Government to work with COSLA, the Institute of Revenues Rating and Valuation, to create regulations surrounding this issue. And it was a difficult issue, exactly a difficult issue to try and add in at a stage two um, amendment, but I think the commitment I've had that that work is now going to be ongoing and we'll hopefully get that work finished by the end of this calendar year, I think is something I would very much welcome. And I think Broadly, we had a constructive debate yesterday on the bill as we went through all of our amendments, even though we disagree on lots of issues. I think it clarified the work that has gone into simplifying a very complex system of trans tra taxation and trying to ensure the greater level of transparency that there is support from around the table. And I do want to see how the changes we have made to the bill, in particular the debate around um, the work on the fiscal framework will actually be brought forward. The wider movement to financially empower and fund our local authorities who are, let, let us not forget, at the heart of the bill, because the money raised through non-domestic rates goes to our local authorities. And the provision of local services for anyone who was just listening in the last debate is absolutely critical to all of our communities. And one of the issues that was central to yesterday's debate, it was picked up both myself and by Graeme Simpson, was the important role of opposition parties in testing the boundaries of legislation. In our principal discussions at stage one, then in the detailed discussions at stage two, whether it's future-proofing a bill, as my amendment to low carbon energy does, which we agreed to yesterday, or the testing or the debate being opened up on key issues more broadly and critically on how legislation will work in practice. I want to use my example of student accommodation, which was an issue highlighted in the Barclay report, but not included in legislation. And as I said yesterday, my initial amendment was to tackle an issue, particularly visible in our cities, and one which crosses ministerial portfolios, from finance to housing to education, went into the bill with cross-party support, and I undertook consultation with key stakeholders. But due to the size and issue of its cross-cutting nature and the chance of unintended consequences hitting students already facing high rents, I was persuaded, having consulted with uh, stakeholders and with support across the chamber, that the face of the bill wasn't the best way to tackle this issue. So we've, we were able to raise an issue about the debt that students are, and graduates particularly are facing. And the research that's been done by NUS alongside Unipol highlights that there are university institutions that provide student accommodation that is very good and in, in it's more cost effective because it provides students with special needs, provides for adaptable accommodation, it provides quiet blocks, supports students with families, and they have annual rent discussions. And I think there is best practice that we need to learn from. Um, the Mayor of London has new planning requirements that ensures affordable student housing to be provided by universities, an issue that's been raised in Edinburgh, particularly in the context of our new local plan. And in Ireland, the link has been Must made come between to close, rent pressure zones and affordable student accommodation. So I think this is the job of us in this chamber, to listen to our constituents. It's not just the job of opposition. It's about testing and pushing legislation at every stage of the process to make sure it works for everyone. And I believe it's something that we have done collectively and successfully on this bill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I call Andy Whiteman for up to four minutes, please. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. And I'd also like to thank all those who've engaged uh, in this process and supported the process in Parliament. Um, I noted at stage one, indeed, the Minister mentioned it in her opening remarks, that this is the first time the Scottish Parliament has considered primary legislation on non-domestic rates. And this is very telling, I think, because it demonstrates how little interest there's been in Parliament on local tax. 
and also how much power the 1992 GATT Act gave to the Secretary of State for Scotland, now Scottish Ministers, in relationship to the detailed design uh, of the system through secondary legislation. Now, Presenting Officer, in September 2013, Derek Mackay, who was here a minute ago, um, the then Minister of Local Government and Planning, said that the Scottish Government would, and I quote, conduct a thorough and comprehensive review of the whole business rate system by 2017, which would deliver, and I quote, a fairer, simpler, and more efficient business rate system. That review never took place. Instead, we had the Barclay Review, which asked only one question. That question was, how would you redesign the business rate system to better support business and incentivise investment? Not an inappropriate question to ask, uh, but there are many, many other questions should have been asked as well. And this narrow focus, I think, raises some fundamental points about how we develop policy and legislation. Uh, we heard yesterday, for example, of major questions about who sets the tax rate on the treatment of privately owned student uh, uh, residences. Uh, concerns have been raised about the manner in which Section 10 came into being, not as a consequence of any review of charitable relief, but as a means by which to raise some revenue to pay for the tax cuts that Barclay was focused on. And I think that too often, government, for whatever reason, feels the need to outsource policy development to so-called independent reviews. And instead of reaching out to the public, to other politicians, uh, with a discussion paper or a consultation to gather views on the possible scope of legislation, which would, for the first time, deal with primary legislation in this area, it asks others to do the thinking. Thinking which is framed by a remit, which in the case of the Barclay Review, was incredibly narrow. And then we have a bill to implement any reforms needed. But not surprisingly, MSPs have their own ideas about reform of non-domestic rates. And we have to work within the confines of the stage two process uh, to develop these. In the case of the non-domestic rate bill, of course, this was the first time that anybody in here had the chance to do something because there's never been the opportunity up till now. And the minister in her opening remarks talked about the past few weeks being bumpy uh, and about aspects of this being used as a plaything. I'd call it democracy. Uh, and I think we should actually improve the system. Presenting officers in stage two, I've had meetings and conference calls with many business groups. And while we disagree on many issues, it was something of a surprise to hear how they agreed with me that the comprehensive review that was promised back in 2013, 2013 um, is still needed. I did point out it was a bit late, but uh, there we are. Uh, now, I want to conclude my remarks just by saying something on my attempt to repatriate rate setting to councils. This was not agreed. Um, but I'm sure it's going to happen. Because yesterday I quoted the comments by the Constitutional Steering Group who drafted the uh, standing orders for this place um, when they produced their 20th anniversary report. And I quote, The Scottish Constitutional Convention recommended that Scotland Act should commit the Scottish Parliament to securing and maintaining a strong and effective system of local government embodying the principle of subsidiarity. What we have seen instead with successive governments is a tightening of central control over local budgets and spending priorities. And our view is that the benefits of bringing decision-making back to Edinburgh in 1999 should flow through to proper empowerment of local communities through their local representative bodies. As I also highlighted at stage one, the removal of this tax base from the control of its historic owners, local government, is in our view a violation of international law. Article 9 of the Council of Europe's European Charter of Local Self-Government provides legal protection. Article 9.3 states, states that part, at least, of the financial resources of local authorities shall derive from local taxes and charges of which, within the limits of statute, they have the power to determine the rate. Today, they do not. And the removal of this tax base from the control of its historic owners is, in our view, a violation of international law. And therefore, officer, we don't believe this can be allowed to persist because it does. Uh, so we cannot support this bill, but neither will we stand in the way, and Greens will abstain in the motion this evening. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Call Willie Rennie for up to four minutes, please. Yeah, I get the point. Um, I think uh, Andy Whiteman's contribution there was actually typical of his approach to the whole bill. I think he has brought the bill to life. Um, I hope not to embarrass him too much with, with praise, but I genuinely think he enlightened the debate and challenged us all. I think challenged many of us with our localism credentials. Uh, and I think the bill is better for that. Certainly the debate was better for that. It was a great disappointment to me that we didn't follow through with his, um, the um, localization of the non-domestic rates. I think it would have empowered uh, local authorities in the way that he described. But his contribution this afternoon, I thought was typical um, of his contribution more generally to the, to the discussion. I also want to, to praise Kate Forbes for in the way she's approached this as well. Always polite and respectful, even though when she clearly, strongly disagrees with every single word that we're saying, 
but she's very respectful with that. And I think an example of that was yesterday, the way that she adeptly avoided just getting into the pit with the Conservatives over the independent schools debate. Um, she just neatly d avoided the whole debate. I would rather she had engaged in the debate a little bit more rather than hiding behind the Barclay Review. But nevertheless, um, that was an example of her polite and respectful way, um, perhaps, of dealing with this whole bill. I also want to, to praise the, the committees and uh, the, cl the clerks and the, the officials as well for their contribution uh, to this uh, bill. Uh, I think it should have gone much further. Um, I think the opportunity for substantial reform for local government is desperate. I think we do need it and we need it now because local authorities, if anybody's a plaything, local authorities are the plaything of central government. Um, they're given responsibilities, but they're not given the freedom to be able to do those things in the way that they would fit within their communities. They should live up to their responsibilities of the promises they make, just like this parliament and this government should live up to its responsibilities and the decisions that it makes. We should be giving local authorities the power to raise the majority of the money they spend, just like this parliament has got the power to do exactly the same. Because when you control the purse strings, not just now, when you control the purse strings, you can control your own destiny. And the sooner we learn that in this place, I think the stronger our communities will be as a result. So, we are unable to support um, this bill today. We have to make a stand at some point over bills that just tinker with the system rather than delivering the radical change that we want. So we won't be able to support the bill uh, this afternoon. Um, and I think it's also made a mistake on the, the principle of the independent schools issue. Uh, of course, there's, a, there's merits to, and arguments around about the merits of independent schools. And I don't wish to get into that. What I do worry about is us interfering with the operation of OSCAR. OSCAR should be able to make the judgments as to who is a charity and who is not a charity. And therefore, that should be the criteria upon which we should review all charities. We're creating two tiers of um, charities. And I think that is regrettable. And I think secretly the minister probably um, believes in that too. So we do need bigger reforms. I, we're taking part in the the local government um, finance reform discussions cross-party uh, on the council tax reform. I'm hoping that the government may come forward with quite substantial proposals for that so we can agree a constructive way forward. We've suggested uh, a land value taxation system which we believe could be utilised right across um, local government uh, finance. That's our contribution to that debate. But there is a commitment being made today on the fiscal framework for councils and I hope it isn't another false dawn, because councils have been promised repeatedly the reform, as Andy Whiteman rightly pointed out earlier on, repeated, repeatedly been promised big reforms which have not been delivered. So I hope that something comes out of the bill that is positive. I'm not optimistic. Thank you. Now move to the open debate, and its speeches have absolutely no more than four minutes. Can I, I warn people that if people do go over, it will disadvantage members near the end of the debate. And I've got James Dornan followed by Alexander Stewart. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Uh, before I start in my role as convener for the Local Government and Communities Committee, I'd like to thank the Clarks, the team at SPICE, the Government, and the many people and organisations who provided us with evidence, and of course my fellow committee members. And I'd like to remind people that the committee were working to a pretty strict remit. Uh, in terms of what we were doing at committee. And I think that what came out of the committee was well worth the work that we put into it. I enjoy convening the committee throughout the bill's legislative stages, so I'm delighted to be given the opportunity to take part in today's proceedings. Signing officer, there were of course some inevitable points of discussion, stroke disagreement during the committee scrutiny that I will mention, briefly mention. Relief for private schools was one, which Murdo Fraser's just spent an inordinate amount of time discussing, and Andy Whiteman's amendment business rates, the devolution of business rates was another. The arguments in these two areas got a good airing yesterday, and I won't go over them again today. They may have been the most contentious issues, but lest we forget, the committee stage one report unanimously endorsed the general principles of the bill. We welcomed it as an important staging post on the road to modernisation of the system that began with Kenneth Bartley and his colleagues were appointed in summer 2016 with a wide remit to seek to enhance and reform non-domestic rates. To have reached the point where we are, it appears about to agree to a bill of some of whose provisions will come into force in April is an impressive show of momentum and credit is due to the Commission and the Scottish Government for their work. I'd just like to go back to that bit about uh, it appears we're going to agree. I'm really disappointed to hear the three previous uh, parties that have spoken have all 
it look as if they've searched through to see if there's something they can disagree with so that they can't support the bill. I th and I find that very, very disappointing. They seem to support a lot of it, find something and then decide that they can't vote for it. However, a staging post on the bill is not a destination. The committee noted that much of the bill was a framework with some crucial details still to be sorted out. In the two or three minutes I have left, I'll focus on areas where I think the committee would agree the momentum should be kept up. The bill will speed up the evaluation cycle from five to three years. Everybody welcomed it. It does mean more work for assessors. This is at a time when the profession told us recruitment and retention was becoming a bit of a problem. The government pointed out it's already provided additional resources in anticipation of the Bartley reforms to the tune of 2.5 million this financial year. The assessors themselves accept this is not just about money, but longer term, the role needs to be made more visible and attractive to graduates and school leavers, giving assessors more power to carry out their core role as the bill does should help too. And appeals against revaluation, again, everyone agrees there are currently too many. They clog up the system. The bill puts in place ambitious reforms to the appeal system, which will improve decisions and build trust in the system. It's widely accepted that we all have succeeded if it brings these numbers down and overall provides finality on what your rates bill is sooner. In our stage one report, we noted three areas where changes could be made. First, more digitalisation and a move to a more online system. And I'm pleased to note the government appears to agree. Second, increased transparency and better communications between assessors and taxpayers. The committee heard from some taxpayers that much of the current process seems wrapped in mystery. Third, fees for appeal. The aim would not be to create a new income stream. It would similarly be to hit a pause button, to make taxpayers stop and think, is this worth my time and money? Because the numbers alone indicate that currently we have a problem of appeals appearing to be an almost everyday part of the process. Presiding officer, non-domestic rates may not get many people excited. But with hand and heart, I can say this has been one of the most diverse and interesting bills the committee's considered in my time as convener, leading a scrutiny down interesting byways to golf clubs, bandstands and lace factories, amongst others. Crucial challenges do lie ahead, not least of these is reform of the Small Business Bonus Scheme, reforms that the committee hopes will keep the system better features but eliminate its cliff edge and perverse incentives. I do look to hope that this will become legislation tonight. The committee looks forward to renewing our engagement with the non-domestic rate system in the future. Uh, and thank you for your time. Paul Stoll. Alexander Stewart, followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to take part in tonight's debate on the non-domestic rates bill. And as my colleague Murdo Fraser has outlined, however, the Scottish Conservatives are unable to support the bill. As a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee, I would like to thank all who have given evidence, briefings and supported the committee during the passage of the bill. The Scottish Conservatives had been calling for a comprehensive review of the Scottish rate regime for some time. Rate revaluations in recent years have had a negative impact on Scottish businesses, particularly in the northeast of Scotland. And only after pressure from the Scottish Conservatives did Derek Mackay announce a package of relief of 40 million uh, to address that issue. Absolutely. But this bill does not go far enough in addressing the more fundamental problems with the current rates regime. One of the main recommendations of the Bartley Review was to half the large business supplement to bring it into line with the, uh, England. This, however, will not be implemented immediately by the bill. The Scottish Government has, has only gone so far as to commit to doing it when it is affordable. This presiding officer means that large Scottish businesses will remain at a competitive disadvantage to their compatriots south of the border. Whilst we support the specific amendment put forward at stage two, which allowed for further debate on the issue of localism, there have been concerns raised by local authorities and COSLA and business community regarding that. As a party, we are committed to seeing more powers devolved down to local authorities. This includes more flexibility and control over the business rates. However, it was clear that we need to make a more holistic approach uh, to considering such devolved decision-making rather than the piecemeal approach which would result uh, if this was progressed. One of the most concerning measures in this bill was to remove the charitable rate relief from independent schools, which is currently afforded to the sector. And I'd like to pay tribute to my colleague Liz Smith, MSP, who has worked tirelessly on that for, with the sector. Uh, they teach around 4% of pupils in Scotland. Many of these schools struggle to meet their day-to-day -day running costs and changes to the bill could necessitate fee increases, cuts to bursaries and even closures. 
This, in turn, would mean that some pupils needing to be educated in the state sector and could, therefore, uh, ensure that a greater burden on the taxpayer than the increase on the business rate income itself. And I, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, during the, uh, the, the time we had, that in my own region of Mid Scotland and Fife, we have many schools uh, that fall into that category uh, at Dollar in Clackmannan and those uh, across Persia uh, in Glenarmon, Strathall, and Morris's Academy in Colgraston. All of these schools could be jeopardised by this process. These schools not only benefit the pupils who attend, but also are specifically positive to the communities that they represent. And they all have close links with state schools within that sector and can encourage and support them. Uh, so uh, the employment of both direct and indirect uh, in the business community has an impact as well. We must remember that education is a public good and that it benefits everyone, not just those in receipt of regardless of whether Absolutely. they are delivered by the state or independent sector or whether parents pay fees directly to schools or indirectly through their taxes. As time's moving on, I'll, I'll conclude. Uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, it is important to put on record that this bill does contain several changes to the rate system that we fully endorse and support. Unfortunately, the bill in its amended and unamended forms does not deliver the wholesale review of the business rates in Scotland that we need to see and we want to see. It is also be harmed to the education sector, as I've said. So therefore, it is regrettable and disappointing that we cannot support the bill at decision time this afternoon. Thank you. Daniel Johnson, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to remind the Chamber of my register of interest. I'm a member of ASDA, the Shop Workers Union, a member of the Federation of Small Business, and I am a director of a, a, a company with retail interest. And I say that not just because it's my duty to do uh, so as a parliamentarian, because I, but more so uh, that, that I rise as a disgruntled shopkeeper rather than an MSP. And let me tell you my uh, history with the non-domestics rates regime. In 2010, when I was running my business, my revaluation for one of the units went from £12,000 rateable value to over £45,000 uh, RV. It took me 18 months to appeal that decision, uh, 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 an appeal that I had to take to the Lion Tribunal. And the explanation and the rationale from the assessor was that I was no longer uh, using an entrance to a shop and therefore they were applying the entire RV to, to another portion. The flaw in that logic to my mind was that access between those two parts of the shop had been blocked up in 1972 and yet 30 years later it was being used as the rationale for the increase in my RV. And the reason for this, this, that story is that non-domestic rates to many small business owners, to many small re retailers, is that it's a regime that is opaque, unintuitive, that its uh, increase has been sporadic, and it has been extremely difficult to appeal. And the reality is, is that this bill is welcome, but it does only really address those last two points. The three-year valuations will provide a consistency <laughs> to the revaluation and remove the the, 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 the um, uh, sporadic and, and large increases that some businesses have experienced. And likewise, the alteration to, to appeals, again, is welcome. Anything that can streamline that process is welcome. But we still have a, a system that will be, for many business owners, will feel largely arbitrary and unfathomable. So there are three things that I think still need to be done. We do need increased transparency because the methodology by which rateable values are calculated is extremely difficult to understand. I know by looking at my own rates bill and the calculations when I was take, taking forward that appeal, there were um, plug figures, literally arbitrary numbers, inflating the value of certain areas of my floor. I do not see what will happen in the, with this bill that will change that. If I look at my own local area and the re most recent revaluation, I surveyed uh, shopkeepers who experienced on average a 10% rise in their rateable value where their rents had been largely flat in the same period. Which takes, which takes me to the second point, is that fundamentally what this, has, uh, what this bill fails to do is to examine and reform the assessors themselves. They are a legacy body which largely reflect a tier of government, regional government, we no longer have. And I think their oversight needs much greater scrutiny so that we have transparency around their calculations and transparency around the work they do. But ultimately, we need the process to be much more streamlined and intuitive, in line with modern 
business practices. And unless this is backed up with real reform in terms of the processes and technology used, we will continue to have issues when it comes to businesses dealing with the non-domestic rates regime. But ultimately, I think the most important points in this uh, debate is that we need a comprehensive review of local government finance and taxation. I think the points made by both Andy Whiteman but also Willie Rennie, both today and in the previous states, are absolutely right. We must have full fiscal devolution, fiscal responsibility for local government. That can't happen if we have piecemeal reform of the taxation that local government have at their, uh, at their disposal. And until we have that comprehensive review, we'll continue to have issues within the non-domestic race regime. Thank you very much. And the last contribution in the open debate is from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too wish to add my thanks to the clerks of the Local Government and Communities Committee for all their hard work and sound advice in taking this bill forward. And looking at the bill, one finds it difficult to construe how someone with as keen a mind as my good friend Graham Simpson could be seduced into backing Amendment 9 at Stage 2. Perhaps he fell victim to the roguish charm of Alexander Stewart or the persuasive arguments of Andy Whiteman, or indeed, as Mr Simpson himself said yesterday, his get-out-of-jail-free card, that amendments are sometimes supported at stage two to test the water. Bless. And the band played Believe It If You Like. Graham Simpson was not swimming yesterday, he was drowning. Like Pinocchio, his nose was growing with every word he spoke. It was good to see the Tories, no doubt chastened by the barrage of 27 business organisations, telling them that, with regard to removal of uniform business rates, they shouldn't be so daft, reverse their position from that at stage two. I welcome their road to Damascus conversion to common sense, something we didn't see from the Greens, who understand did not even publish the results of their own consultation from last September. Labour 2, you turned on this after taking representation from USDAW. I welcome that they listened. Amendments 23 and 23A look to be a clever manoeuvre, but Mr Whiteman looked like a rabbit in the headlights as his erstwhile Tory and Labour allies deserted him, even suggesting that Sarah Boyack was sidling up to Derek Mackay, something he happily did in 2017, 2018 and 2019. Then Grinch-like in Amendment 25, Mr Whiteman argued in effect that charity shops should have to pay rates regardless of whether the local authority decided to waive its rights to impose 20%. This seems to me to be a reversal of the localism he purports to champion. The Lib Dems supported the Greens, passing over the eight years of Lib Dem Labour Scottish, uh, Scottish executive notorious for ring-fencing 60 different local authority budget lines. This entire episode shows how important it is that colleagues examine the impacts of amendments before deciding whether or not to support them. Now, as for all this nonsense about private schools, one would think that drastic change is being imposed. In fact, paying fees is equivalent of about 1.3% of fee income. And here I must apologise to the Chamber, Presiding Officer, because yesterday I said it was 1.8%. This is, of course, a lot less than the 6% impact of teacher pay rises and pension changes last year, and indeed uh, significantly less than the 4% uh, average fee rises we've seen in recent years. The Tories are clearly obsessed with this relatively minor part of the bill and by not supporting it are throwing the baby out of the bathwater. I'll take a brief intervention. Liz Smith. <coughs> Mr Gibson, it's not the Tories that are obsessed by this. It's the genuine concern of many parents who have children at independent schools. Kenneth uh, Gibson. No one wants to pay more, but 1.3% when you're paying 4% on average fees. And let's be honest, most of the people who go to these schools are, are better off, shall we say, than the majority. Of course, the, the reason for the Tories being so concerned about this is no doubt because many of them attend such schools or send their children there, although not one declared an interest, as Neil Finlay pointed out yesterday. An unseemly dozen Tories felt the need to suck up to their constituents' associations with those who attended comprehensives, particularly keen to speak, and those who attended Eton and Harrow, surprisingly sedate. I hope when Michelle Ballantyne takes over, she will impose a better balance on her array of speakers. As for not consulting, the committee took plenty of evidence, including a visit and meeting at George Watson's, Liz Smith's alma mater, the school she attended, taught at, and even wrote a book about. Bursaries, all that does is enable private schools to hoover up talented young folk from the state sector to help their grades Come and thereby allow them to please. charge yet more fees. State schools pay rates, private schools should pay rates too, and I'm delighted that Parliament overwhelmingly agreed. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call Sarah Boyack for absolutely no more than four minutes, please. Okay, well, it makes you wonder how we get through our committee, but we have got from James Dornan to Kenny Gibson, who was gracious as ever. 
Um, I think this legislation is not perfect. I'll be clear about that. The Barclay Review didn't cover everything, um, and we had some uh, tight discussions at the committee. But I think um, this bill does move forward. It does pick up on some of the key issues in the Barclay Review. And the challenge for us in this parliament is going to be post-legislative scrutiny. And I think a lot of the detailed concerns will require detailed discussions afterwards. I think some of the amendments from Alexander Stewart about affirmative, not negative instruments, the need for more consultation, the additional things we've managed to get the minister to agree to move on. It is about what happens next. And I think because you disagree with something in the bill, it's up to the political parties as to what they want to do. But we think there is enough progress in this bill to have made this whole process worthwhile. The review was tightly constrained and it could have covered more things, but we have dealt with what was in front of us, particularly in relation to the uh, devolution on non-domestic rates. There was a key issue of not just hearing from, but listening to colleagues in local government. And a strong view that came through was that at the moment, devolving non-domestic rates without reviewing the fiscal settlements, without the powers more generally, would entrench inequality between some of our local authorities. And that was a key concern about equalisation, particularly at a time when their budgets are stretched to breaking point. So I think we have demonstrated that we listen, even though we are having lots of debates. I do think that the fiscal framework is absolutely critical, and the comments made by Willie Rennie I would very much agree with about the need to um, reform the existing council tax, which is regressive and a failure and not up to date. So there is a lot of work we need to do on that, and the Conservatives could come and join the rest of us on what is clearly a difficult issue. I finally want to comment on the debate uh, we've had on private schools, the reason for the Conservatives not voting for this today. Now, today, Myrtle Fraser said that this was about the politics of envy. And I just want to finish on this point. It is not about the politics of envy. It's about the politics of fairness. The comment from the Barclay Review was that independent and private schools are charities that benefit from reduced or zero rates bills, whereas council or state schools do not qualify and generally will pay rates that is unfair and inequality should end by removing eligibility for charity relief from all independent schools. I think that is the right place for us to be. The minister, no I won't, the minister will have the flexibility to, to look at individual schools that make a case to her. That was the point raised by Andy Whiteman yesterday. So there is scope for ministers to act, but as a general principle, we support the fact that this has come in this bill. We will be supporting this bill this afternoon. I thought the points made by Daniel Johnson were spot on about the reality check of what it's like if you are actually running a small business. Hopefully we've made some progress in this bill, but there will be more to follow and the increased transparency and the oversight and crucially parliamentary accountability that is crucial in going forward from this bill today, and I hope that this is not the end of the story on the other issues that colleagues have raised. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I call Graham Simpson for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, this has been a, an interesting journey. Um, it's fair to say that what looked like a fairly uncontroversial bill has proved to be anything but. Uh, but I want to start my closing remarks by expressing disappointment. The Scottish Conservatives should have been in the position of being able to support this bill. It's largely sensible. Any issues that we had could have been ironed out. Our big concern, the politically motivated assault on the independent school sector, could have been smoothed over. We offered compromise, but we were talking to a brick wall. Now, Kate Forbes has got her own way on this, but she should not be happy because treating one part of the charitable sector different to the rest has been attacked by the charity regulator, and I could well imagine a, a legal challenge. Now, my party should have been able to back this bill, but Ms Forbes was not for moving, and I, I suspect that comes from higher up. I don't think that comes from Kate Forbes. I think this could come maybe even from the First Minister. The upshot of hitting charities with bigger bills is that some will close. I'm convinced that some smaller schools won't survive because of what Parliament is about to do. I hope that Hamilton College in my own region survives. Perhaps the Minister can advise what should happen 
to the pupils and the building they're in, should that happen. I could see it being a top-class hotel or private leisure centre. Elitist. How ironic. Now, here's what the Scottish Council of Independent Schools told me today. Quote, the 30,000 families, more than 3,000 teachers, and more than 3,000 non-teaching staff in the independent sector will yesterday have been left in no doubt over the support or otherwise forthcoming from the Chamber. Any cursory post-legislative scrutiny would have shown the Parliament the genuine success of the 2005 Charity Act and unique public benefit test. And they go on to say, the independent sector will keep doing what it does best for pupils across Scotland from all backgrounds, from all political persuasion and none. That is Scotland's highest attainment, keeping subject choice as wide as possible, exporting Scottish education to the wider world, bringing pupils from over 50 countries to this country and making real changes to lives in their extracurricular offer and well-being agendas, close quotes. Now, until we got to stage two of the bill, the independent schools issue had attracted the most comment. And then all hell broke loose when Andy Whiteman unleashed his Amendment 9 onto the world. What a hoo-ha there was. And to my mind, what should have been an opportunity to debate the issue of devolving rate setting to local government got completely out of hand, absolutely out of hand. Now, Sarah Boyack said earlier, and she was right, that stage two um, should have been an opportunity uh, to test issues such as her own amendment on student accommodation uh, and, and, to, and to do that properly. Well, at least we have a commitment to look at the issue of local government funding and that's to be welcomed, so some good has come of it. Now, where we've ended up is not a bill that has widespread support. Business has concerns. They think they're being penalised. They think the system here will put them at a disadvantage compared to other parts of the UK. And here's what Dr Liz Cameron, Chief Executive of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, had to say. We're deeply concerned about the uh, impact of Section 8B of the bill, which has the effect of completely removing Scottish ratepayers' appeal rights when there is a change in economic circumstances. I mentioned that yesterday. The Conservative Party tabled a Stage 3 amendment to seek such a consultation, but all other parties voted against this sensible amendment to what we believe is a part of the bill that will be damaging to all ratepayers. And that's not something the Minister should be proud of. So we have uh, a bill that could have been so much better. Business is only happy because something that wasn't in the bill originally still isn't in it, but they're not happy by what is in it. The charity sector doesn't like it. It could all have been so different, presiding officer. We could, we should have been able to support it, but we can't. And I call the minister. Well, the Minister, Kate Forbes to conclude. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by responding to some of the specific points that have been made uh, and also to commend uh, Andy Whiteman for his efforts to raise the profile of non-domestic rates and this bill more generally through his amendments. I recognise that it might be cold comfort, but I do respect the fact that he's standing up for something that he passionately believes in and on that basis I understand his decision not to support the bill. But I want to thank him for his challenge, his challenge of pushing me harder and making me rethink on a number of, um, of occasions and also my officials to think and then think again. And whilst a faster review of the fiscal framework may be poor consolation compared to changing the law altogether, I don't think that the debate has been in vain. It may have been a frustrating experience in part, but I think he's done more to raise awareness of this issue than anybody else. I'm disappointed but understand that the Conservatives, whilst they support 27 substantive sections of the bill, do not support one substantive section of the bill and therefore won't be supporting the bill overall. Uh, in terms of uh, Labour's position, I think Sarah Boyack is quite right to say that this is just the beginning for a lot of the issues that we have been airing for the first time during this process and Daniel Johnson brought to life the impact of the non-domestic non rate system on real ratepayers who up and down the country are contending with the non-domestic rates system. I do think that this bill progresses 
the, the issues quite significantly. Daniel Johnson, Sarah Boyack and James Dornan all talked about the next steps and the need for post-legislative scrutiny. And this bill clearly is not coming to the end of its road tonight, although there will be a vote. This bill has um, opened a, a number of conversations, whether that's on the issue of uh, Phoenix companies, which we have uh, agreed a timetable with Labour colleagues, which we are happy to share with other colleagues as well to explore this issue further and to look at potential resolutions. Could we I have also committed to, to a in, fiscal please. framework as well with local authorities, and we will progress that at pace. We are committed to keeping up the momentum um, and the appeals subgroup, for example, is being reconvened tomorrow uh, to look at some of the issues that have been flagged. So whilst I'm delighted that this bill does do a lot and does deliver um, what ratepayers are looking for, failure to support the bill tonight will deprive councils of policy responsibility for empty property relief. It will deprive them of powers to prevent ratepayers running up large debts and of powers to tackle tax avoidance, including phoenixing and abuse of small business bonus scheme and charity relief. This bill allows assessors to collect information necessary to set accurate rateable values and to um, allow them to resolve appeals more efficiently and effectively. It will support ratepayers um, and help them not to be as exposed to the risks of volatility, to the risks of inconsistency and a cumbersome and irresponsive appeals system. Presiding officer, this bill delivers the Barclay review of non-domestic rates. It supports growth, it improves the administration of the system, it increases fairness for ratepayers, it has the support of the Scottish Government for those reasons. But more importantly, it has the support of the business community and local government as well. It has the support of Ken Barclay and at decision time tonight, I hope that it also has the support of the Scottish Parliament. Thank you very much. And that concludes our point of order, Gail Ross. Thank you. President Officer, last week in Chamber, Rhoda Grant made a point of order. She maintained that an intervention that I had made on her speech the previous week was incorrect. She said that air traffic controllers at Wick John O'Groats Airport and Bembecula Airport had not been consulted with over the changes to the centralised air traffic control system, and I challenged this assertion. In her point of order, Rhoda Grant stated... Perhaps Gail Ross would like to take the opportunity to amend the record, apologise for misrepresenting her constituents and join me in attempting to save these vital jobs. Well, perhaps Rhoda Grant would like to do some research before her next point of order because, presiding officer, I have here a list of all the engagements the ATMS programme has had with the staff at both WIC and Bimbecula airports. Oh. Oh. 2018... 1st of November, 7th of, the no of November, 5th of December, 2019, 4th of February, 17th of April, 23rd of April, 1st of May, 3rd of May, 30th of May, 26th of June, 11th of November, and most recently in 2020, the 16th of January. Will she now admit that my point of order was correct? And there has been engagement with staff 16 meetings with both airports and opportunities for one-to-one -one phone calls. And I look forward to her apology for the insinuation that I do anything but my absolute best for the people in my hometown of Wick. Thank you. Could I thank uh, Ms Ross for advance notice for that point of order? Uh, I would uh, highlight that it's not actually a point of order. In fact, I'm just going to repeat almost precisely what I said to Ms Grant last week, which is that there is a process, a procedure for highlighting, uh, for making corrections to the official report if a member believes a correction is needed. I would encourage the members to write to each other and then a member can correct the official report if necessary. They are not matters to adjudicate on this table, in this, in this chamber. And having said that, as I said to Ms Grant, the point that Ms Ross has now made is on the record. Can I hope, suggest to both members, they have made their points and not to raise it any further in this chamber? Thank you very much. Thank you. Point of order, Murder Fraser. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, giving evidence to the REC committee this morning, 
Jim McCall, the chairman of Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited, said that the finance secretary, Derek Mackay, told him that the CML board, a company wholly owned by the Scottish Government, had written a legal letter to the minister to say that they would all resign if the minister intervened in the Ferguson dispute. On the 3rd of September 2019, in response to questions from both Willie Rennie and myself, where we both asked the finance secretary directly if it was true that the CML board had threatened to resign if the government intervened, the finance secretary told parliament this in response, and I quote directly from the official report, I am not aware of the position that members have expressed to me. Presiding officer, I'm sure it would be of concern to all members if the finance secretary had misled parliament on the 3rd of September as to the existence of that letter. Has the finance secretary approached you, presiding officer, with a request to make a statement to parliament in order to correct the record? Can I also thank Mr Fraser for advance notice of the point of order. Now I do recognise clearly accuracy in the chamber is a matter of great importance. However, this is a matter of contention amongst members. It is a matter that is being pursued by the committee and it's my understanding that the, the committee will provide a forum for members to pursue this matter further. In fact, it's my understanding that the cabinet secretary will be appearing before the members at that committee at a future date. Thank you very much. I think I was expecting another point of order, but that's very good to hear. So at that point, could I call on the Minister, Graham D, uh, to move business motion 20732 on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Minister. No member has wished to ask to speak on the motion. The question therefore is that motion 20732 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, thank you. The next item is consideration of five parliamentary bureau motions. Could I call on Graeme Day once more on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 20733 on designation of a lead committee, 20734 on substitution on a committee, on committee, sorry, 20735 and 20736 on approval of an SSI, and 20737 on committee membership. Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. So we're going to turn now to decision time. Now, uh, before the first question, I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Kate Forbes is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Rhoda Grant will fall. So the first question, is that amendment 20716.4 in the name of Kate Forbes, which seeks to amend motion 20716 in the name of Murdo Fraser on no case for tax increases or further cuts to public spending be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 20716.4 in the name of Kate Forbes is yes 58, no 57, and there was one abstention. The amendment is therefore agreed. So, what is this? The amendment in the name of Rhoda Grant therefore falls, and the next question is that motion 20716 in the name of Murdo Fraser as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are, we're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now on the amended motion. The result of the vote on motion 20716 in the name of Murder Fraser as amended is yes 58, no 38. There were 20 abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. 
Now, the next question is that motion 20705 in the name of Kate Forbes on the non-domestic rates Scotland bill at stage three be agreed. And members, because this is an act, members should cast their votes and vote now. The result of the vote on motion 20705 in the name of Kate Forbes, yes 78, no 32, there were six abstentions, the motion is agreed and the non-domestic rate Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> now I propose to ask a single question on the five parliamentary bureau motions, does any member object? That's good. So the question is that motions 20733 to 20737 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Gordon MacDonald on the Chain Gang Singing Group. But we'll just take a few moments pause for members uh, and the Minister to change seats. Just a pause.